Okay, welcome. Let us begin with a word of prayer. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Almighty, everlasting God, Lord, Heavenly Father, whose word is a lamp to our feet and a light on our way, open and enlighten our minds that we may understand your word purely, clearly, and devoutly. And then, having understood it all right, fashion our lives in accord with it, in order that we may never displease your majesty, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our dear Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, ever one God, world without end. Amen. Amen. So let's start with a little bit of background about the Gospel of John, not historically, but just about how it's written. One of the things that's so unique about this gospel as compared to the synoptics is that John doesn't give a linear timeline of events. It isn't a straightforward storytelling like Mark, and it's not a nice orderly account like Luke. Instead of a single straightforward timeline, John has more of a jumbled up time ball of string, like a bubbly wobbly timey wimey mess. The end of the book is present at the beginning. Things that happen later in the narrative cause things that happen before them. There are things that haven't happened yet, which are referenced in the present all the time. The whole book is this tightly woven tapestry of complex relationships. So much so that the first thing any preacher learns when we have to preach from the Gospel of John is that it's almost impossible to preach a single part of the Gospel of John without preaching the whole thing. What does this mean? It means that if there is one book that you really can't take a single verse out of and just run with it, it would be this one. So it is no small irony then that the most popular standalone Bible verse there is out there in the world that people have latched onto is from this book, the Gospel of John. They took one verse out of the one book that's the worst possible one to pluck a verse out of. <laughs> but here it is. You've heard it. It's been tweeted. It gets liked and shared on Facebook more than cat memes. It's been shouted triumphantly and whispered in fervent prayer. It's been cross-stitched into wall hangings. It's on bumper stickers. It's glommed onto dorm room walls. It's embossed on commemorative bracelets. Back in the day when we could have fans in the stands at sport games, there was always one low-res self-proclaimed Christian that holds it up on a sign as they root for their team. It's got its own line of t-shirts. People have it tattooed on their bodies. I've even seen it on the bottom of coffee cups. John 3, 16. It's the rock star Bible verse that everyone already knows and just plain gets by heart, right? And here it is to save the day. Preachers might as well sit down and not preach at all because John 3, 16, man. We got this one, pastor. You don't need to explain it any further. God might as well have written a mic drop at the end of it. John 3.16, boom, I'm out of here. <laughs> For the two of you that haven't heard it yet, John 3.16 says this. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. This one most famous Bible verse is the battle cry of Christians everywhere. Let me explain a moment how our culture uses this verse before I go and ruin it. John 3.16 trotted out, is trotted out like my grandmother would trot out the song, Santa Claus is coming to town for the entire month of December. She would wag her finger at me and sing that song to keep me in my place. And this is how we as a culture often sing John 3.16. You better not make a fuss now. You know who's coming to town. John 3.16 knows if you've been bad or good, so be good for goodness sake. God loved the world so much that he sent his son to die for you. So you better believe in that son and get you some eternal life or else. The implication is that this is a verse of judgment on those who don't have Christ in their lives. If you haven't believed enough or if you don't decide for Christ, you aren't responding properly to how much God loved the world in this verse. The story goes that John 3.16 judges those who don't believe. However, if that's what this verse truly says, 
if the rock star popular culture usage of this Bible is, passage is correct, I don't want any part of it. And I would venture neither would the writer of the Gospel of John. <laughs> and so, as I promised, I am going to ruin this Bible verse for you. But then I hope you will also get life from it once we're done. Fame hasn't done John 3.16 any favors. And so my purpose in ruining this verse is to bring life back to it, to bring the good back in. What our culture has done to John 3.16 is it's made it devoid of the promises of God. The very fact that it is so famous should at once make you suspicious. You see, the Bible is a weak and foolish text full of disturbing things and the promises of God. And the promises of God are not, in fact, popular. They don't fill um, stadiums full of cheering fans. They don't make quick, engaging TikTok videos. The promises of God can even get kind of ugly, as the Gospel of John will show us time and again. Uh, there's an, uh, this is another class for another day, but Jesus says, gnaw on my flesh, and that's disturbing, but that's not for this class. Um, that'll be later on. Um, but uh, this is the type of thing that the promises of God contain. And that's but and so the what the culture has done to John 3.16 is make it devoid of those things and has turned it into either judgment or something we want to judge, like a washed up rock star. But when we step back for a moment and look at it from the context as these words were intended to be heard, we will see that the idea that God loved the world so much in John 3.16 actually misses the entire point of this passage. So let's take a moment now. I've done a lot of talking here. Um, let's uh, read the verse in its context. Can we have a volunteer? Does someone have it in front of them? If you could read for us chapter 3, verses 11 to 21. Anyone able to jump in? <laughs> I know, you didn't expect to have a reading portion, huh? Oh yeah, heaven forbid we do a Bible study and, and break out a Bible. <laughs> I've got it. You got it? Yes. Uh, chapter 3, verses 11 to 21. Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. I have told you earthly things and you do not believe. How can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the son of man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the son of man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people loved the darkness rather than the light, because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his work should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have, carried, have been carried out in God. Thank you. Already... Did anybody hear something that sounded a little bit different than that cultural interpretation that I just read? Might have sounded just the same to you because I haven't ruined the verse yet, um, but we'll get there, I promise. Um, but I, it, it, already from the context, it's problematic to think of John 3.16 as judging who is in and who is out of the Christian club when right on its heels comes John 3.17, the next verse where it specifically says this is not about condemnation. It's not about judgment. 
Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn those that do not hold John 3.16 in their hearts. But God sent God's Son in order that God's love would take flesh in us so that we now have under our flesh God's love. Let's break it down now. I'm going to, uh, uh, now I'm going to get into what, what I call the ruining of it, where I, I take um, this verse, John 3, 16, word for word. So let's start with the first word, which is what? It's not what, but what is it? It's... <laughs> Anybody jump in. For. It's for, yes. Because. It's for. The first word is for. Um, and this should already make trouble again for you just speaking John 3.16 as if it was its own thing. No one starts a thought with the word for. Just out of the blue. It doesn't make sense for me to say, for we will now all go get ice cream. When a sentence starts with the word for, it tells us there was something that came before what you are saying in order that you are now responding to. So John 3.16 is the end of a long argument, not the beginning of one. Furthermore, these words are spoken to a specific person in a specific time and place. Does anyone remember who it is? Nicodemus. Yes. His name is Nicodemus. Nicodemus is the one, um, if you remember, and maybe you don't, I'll tell you, he is the one who has it stuck in his head that faith is something that you can do. He comes to Jesus in the middle of the night and completely misunderstands everything that Jesus says. Jesus talks about being born again from Anothen, from above, and Nicodemus is ready to crawl back into his mother's womb. Nicodemus' principal mistake is that he thinks that there's something to be done about faith. Faith for him is like a work that you have to do to get into heaven. So it is to correct this very misunderstanding that Jesus speaks John 3.16 to Nicodemus. Jesus picks passive image after passive image to explain how faith happens to Nicodemus. He talks about being born again. He talks about, and birth is passive, right? You can't decide for or against being born. You can't run the other direction. Someone simply cuts you out or squeezes you out when the time is ripe, right? He talks about wind blowing and how the spirit goes where it will. You can't control the wind, Nicodemus. And so it is with faith. And Nicodemus doesn't get it. He asks, how can these things be? And Jesus says, well, if you don't understand when I tell you using earthly things like birth and the wind, how are you going to understand when I talk about heavenly things? But Jesus goes for broke and tells us the heavenly things anyway. He says, no one goes up to heaven except the one who comes down, the son of man, who will be lifted up on a cross so that no one may perish, but all will have eternal life. And that might sound familiar to you because we read something just like it. See, John 3.16 is a repeated chorus of this earlier conversation with Nicodemus. So the truth that Jesus is trying to get through to Nicodemus is that God comes down. There is no amount of doings that you can stand on to get to, to heaven. And so this is what is repeated to in John 3.16. It's a message that we don't have to go up to God with our love, but instead God came down to us with this love. All of that, and we're still only on the first word. So the next word is God. That one's actually pretty fine just the way it is, and this is going to be long enough without me having to explain God to you, so uh, we'll, we'll move on to the next one because the real problem comes with the next word, and it is the word so. That one little two-letter word in for God so loved the world has caused more Nicodemus-like misunderstanding and woe in our reading of the Gospel of John than a new gate causes consternation and bewilderment for a cow. We are tricked by it back into the very misunderstanding that it is meant to refute, namely that there is something that we must do about faith because we think of it 
we hear that word so and we think we have to respond somehow to it. We owe God something because of that word so. We think God loved the world very, very, very much, so much, and therefore we owe God love in return. But there's an ambiguity in English to the word so. And in the Greek, there are actually two different words for so, where we only have the one word. There is a word in Greek, which means so, as in so much, so very much, but that is not at all what appears in John 3.16. Instead, it is the second word, one that means so, as in just so. In English, we might say, how do you change a tire on your car? Well, like so. I guess that's, that's how you do it, right? No. Um, <laughs> or, or you might say, um, how does she make uh, the basket like that? She did it so, with poise and grace. Um, more than I have, because I'm not good at sports. But it's the second way of saying so, which is meant in John 3.16. So, it would be a better translation to say, for God in this way loved the world that he sent his only son. This is how God loves the world, Nicodemus, like so, by coming down to be present with us in God's son and creating belief and life everlasting within us where we had none. It is not, dear Nicodemus, about what you do or what you yourself believe or owe God in return for God's love. Let me say that again. John 3.16 is an explanation about how God goes about loving the world by coming down to it and becoming incarnate in our very flesh. Next, I will stop with the last word, which is cosmos in Greek or world for us that John uses here for the word world. And the, if you look at the larger context of the gospel of John, world for John is a four letter word. It's a cuss word. For John, the world is the most unlovable, opposite of God-like rotten place you could possibly imagine. If you're curious where we get where I get this idea, the place in the Gospel of John to look for how John thinks about the world is in chapters seven and eight. Um, again, that's probably outside the course of this class, but that's where you will go to see that the conflict with the world is most present and that the world is not a great place, according to John. But that's for another class for another day. So here now, for our purposes, we know that the world um, is, is not that lovable. Um, and so now that we know this, the verse should be completely ruined because a truer way to put John 3.16 is this. Therefore, God in this way loved the unlovable, God-hating world by entering into it. God loved us just so by sending God's unique son to die and be lifted up so that we get without our deserving it everlasting life. Do you still want it on your bumper sticker? <laughs> I hope that I have ruined John 3.16 for you so that you can see that it is not a passage about judgment of non-believers, but it is about promise. It's about the promise that God is with, of all people, us. After all, I recommend to you again the very next verse, John 3, 17, which says, Indeed, God did not send the Son to the world to condemn it, but in order that we shall be saved through him. That is the promise of God. It tells us how the Son came into the rotten world so that God could experience life with us and save us, not to judge, but to save. The truth is, though, that we all think like Nicodemus from time to time. We all cling to this belief that what you do somehow matters for your salvation. Even I think this way sometimes, and I'm a John Hanine scholar. So take the prophet Isaiah, for instance. God appears to Isaiah, and the very first thing Isaiah says is, Oh, woe is me. I have not done anything to deserve God the Most High. My lips are unclean and I curse like a sailor. I have broken your commandments. I'm bad people, Lord. I stink, stay away. That's exactly what it says in Isaiah. You can look it up sometime. How often do we cry out though the same way to God? 
How often do we look down on ourselves and say, yeah, this is just not doing it. God, this is not great, <laughs> what I have going on. But God will act as God will act. And despite Isaiah's protests, God sends a seraph down to where Isaiah is with a hot coal from the fire and burns the sin right out of Isaiah's lips. So that when God asks, whom shall I send to preach my good word? There is nothing left that Isaiah can say, but here I am, Lord, send me. That's what salvation is about. It's about God's promises coming down to us just so until they burn away all of our sin and they change us forever into new people. See, there you go. You got a bonus Bible study on the book of Isaiah in the middle of the passage of John. So, um, so now you have, <laughs> have that as well. That's free. Um, but let's get back to Nicodemus and this promise from God that we don't have to do anything, undeserving though we all may be. God promises to save us through Christ. Salvation comes from above, from a no then, um, again, from God. And this then is the real scandal of John 3.16, that the great way in which God from above loves us is not in power and might, not as a judgmental Santa Claus with a naughty list and a nice list. Instead, God loves us just so, in this way by dying for us, by being lifted up on a cross like a bronze serpent. Now here with the bronze serpent imagery, John is purposely referencing Numbers 21, eight to nine, um, but I've already used my Old Testament book tangent for this class, uh, so that'll have to be for another time. Um, but Christ is lifted up so that we may live. John 3.16 is ruined so that we may live. God loves us in this way, by taking on the brokenness of humanity, by taking on death, sin, and hatred, and God lifts them up away from us by grace and sends us back out into God's loving arms and into the arms of one another. That's what the promises of God do. And they are not popular, but they shine so brightly through the grime and dark that by the time our vision clears, we don't even notice how much we have changed. When we hear God's promises, we become people with things to do and lives to live. That's why I always like to have someone else read the Bible's story in my class, because faith happens when we hear it. When we hear God's word, it changes us. And I always learn something new when I hear someone else read the scripture. We become filled with faith because God has been faithful even in dying for us. And so we no longer have to worry about all of this situation because God has taken care of it, and that frees us up. And so God gives us neighbors so that we don't get bored, as my teacher would always say. <laughs> now you have a bunch of free time on your hands. What are you going to do? Well, you go and you serve others um, the way God has served you. And so then this is the judgment, the judgment that everybody's scared of about John 3.16, that the light has come into the world, and people love the darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil, as it says. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. And now at this point, I have to teach you all my hermeneutical trick. And I teach this in every Bible study I've ever taught. Um, and I, I think it's a useful trick. And I learned it from this very Gospel of John. I, and I actually learned it from Luke as well, where Luke um, talks about um, the people um, who are um, outside the gate, and then he keeps talking, and it's the same people that are then um, getting through the gate. But I learned it from the Gospel of John because part of the complex tapestry of paradoxes that John makes for uh, makes us to confront um, is this trick um, that we are always in both groups. So again, the trick is this. Whenever there are two groups of people in the Bible, we must learn to see ourselves as in all of them. Um, and I, I didn't, I, I did a little messy. Sometimes there's three groups, sometimes there's four. You are all of the groups, like with the soil. Um, you are the rocky soil. You are the 
fertile soil. You are the one choked with vines. Um, learn to see yourself in all of the groups. There's no us over here that have Christ and them over there that don't have Christ. No, you are in both places. Um, and John does this when, when we have all of these paradoxes um, where um, Jesus is fully divine and fully human. The light shines in the darkness. God loves the world. Thomas holds the twin natures of unbelief and belief in his flesh. My namesake is Thomas, so I have to look out for him. Uh, and so we, we are all haters of the light. And we are those who do what is true in the light. The judgment that we read about in verses 19 and 20 is an expression of this very crisis. That as Luther would say, in Christ we are made to be same time sinner and saint. In fact, in the Greek, the word translated here variously as condemnation and judgment is the word krisis, from which the English word crisis is derived. So again, John 3.16 cannot be a blanket statement about demanding belief in Christ, because it is describing the crisis that we are all in. We are same time unbeliever and believer, same time in the dark, but exactly where the light shines heathen and faithful. We are unlovable, we are in the world, and we are loved by God through God's death and lifting up. In this way, John 3.16 expresses what is real. It shows us for who we are. Or again, in John 3.13, it says, no one, dear Nicodemus, has ascended into heaven except the one who has descended from heaven, the Son of Man. We don't ever get to go up to God. We don't ever become by our own strength the people that love the light. Instead, God comes down to us and brings the light and just plain shines it through us whether we like it or not. And usually we don't like it. I mean, how many people like light shining in their face? <laughs> Turn it off, right? <laughs> Confession is oftentimes the most uncomfortable way to begin a service, but we do it that way every week because it has attached to it an and forgiveness. We confess so that we hear forgiveness coming after it right on its heels. And so the light shines and we don't always like being made new, but God does it with these words. God lifts up that darkness and through Christ lifting up, we are dragged through the waters of baptism, kicking and screaming out of the water to become people of faith. Whew, so there, that sermon done. <laughs> Um, do we have any questions or things that people want to shout out? You can put it in the chat or, or just start talking um, and I will respond best I can. Did I ruin John 3.16 for you and did you find life at the end? <laughs> I got one here. Um, does, the, does this John 3.16 and other surrounding verses say that all are going to receive eternal life despite what each of us believe or not? Um, in other words, does it espouse universalism? Well, um, maybe not exactly here, but Jesus does elsewhere in the Gospel of John say strikingly universal sounding things. He says, in the moment when I am lifted up, so that lifted up imagery comes back because everything comes back in the Gospel of John. Never says a word once the Gospel of John doesn't come back as a chorus later. When he says, I am lifted up, I will gather all people to myself, full stop. He doesn't say only the believers. He doesn't say only the, uh, the people that have kept my commandments. He says, I will gather all people to myself. And then he has this th line where he talks about, I have sheep of other folds that do not belong yet, and I will gather them into the fold as well. Um, and so there are um, lots of places in the Gospel of John where Jesus makes these striking universal claims uh, about salvation that, uh, that, that, that are very universal sounding. Um, so, I, I mean, I don't know what to do with that, um, but there you go. That's what Jesus says. So um, unless we were to call Jesus a liar, all people are gathered into that lifting up event. And um, what does that mean? That means that, um, that whether or not we can see it, it's probably going to happen. Um, I like to say trying to deny Christ is like trying to deny a flood. Good luck. Those waters are coming for you. 
Um, it's it's gonna it's it's not a gift that you can leave unwrapped. Like it's not given like the world gives, um, where you can decide to just you know return it and buy something else that you really want. Um, but um, uh, but whether, sometimes we don't understand it, like people of other faiths um, or people um, outside the fold, um, uh, we don't understand, uh, we, we can't fit them in our Christian box, so how could they be included in this event? But there it is, Jesus saying all people. Um, so another way that I like to talk about this um, is is from the, the, the question, I call it um, question nine. Not because there are nine questions, mind you, but because it's the question asked in Romans 9. Um, and Paul in Romans 9 wrestles with this very issue. He says, what about those who don't believe? What about those outside the faith? What are we to do with them? What about the people that haven't heard the good news? If faith happens in hearing, what about those that just have or, have or never will hear? And his answer to question nine is, it's not as if the word of God has failed. It's not as if the, the God coming down to earth or the seeds that God sows will come back empty. Um, God will, in God's good time and in God's good way, do what God has promised to do. And, uh, and so I have to believe that all people will be gathered in um, one way or another, <laughs> like it or not, including me. Um, and that's astonishing. So <laughs> including Isaiah, <laughs> um, you know. Uh, so that's my best my best uh, take at that uh, uh, that question. It's probably more than you'd bargain for, um, <laughs> but there you go. I talked about John and about Paul. Um, you're getting free Bible studies all over the place. Uh, other questions? Tommy, I just thought I'd make a comment that. Oftentimes when meeting with a family, preparing for a funeral, that is a text that they want to hear. And so it's often surprising when I add 317. You know, why are you adding 317? Well, it's because we want to uh, to preach the promise and it's the perfect yeah. verse to preach the promise. It is the perfect verse to preach the promise. Yeah. So you should. So, I mean, you can fix all your bumper stickers. Just add a dash 17. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Just keep reading. Um, and, and that's the thing. Like I like I started with. It's um, like putting this verse in context really changes the meaning and and and. Uh, it, like not even just changing it, but changes it 360 from the way the culture tries to use it. Um, and so one of the things, uh, I mean, I, 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 I let you take it on faith that um, things are present in, in, in the gospel of John that it will happen later, um, but I can show you how it happens because um, chapter breaks are new uh, er, to the text or in relatively speaking, the original text didn't have these clean chapters um, and their breaks to them. We added those later. Um, and really chapter three and chapter four should be read together as a whole because present here um, in this John 316 is the woman at the well. Um, the woman at the well and the story of Nicodemus um, uh, are uh, interwoven in this way. What the, what's said in abstract in John 3.16, that God in this way loves the unlovable world, um, will take on flesh in the conversation that Jesus has with the woman at the well. So this happens time and again in the Gospel of John, because one of the central things for the Gospel of John is the idea of the incarnation. And so anything that's big, like God, is going to take on flesh and walk among us. Um, and it's going to do this time and again in the Gospel of John. Um, and one of, the one of the first ways you see it happen is with um, Nicodemus' story and then the woman at the well. So the woman at the well um, wrestles with, you know, uh, with the, the incarnational story and with um, what it means that God has come down among us. And one of the principal things um, that happens in the incarnation um, is that God has moved into our neighborhood. God tabernacles among us, right? Um, in the prologue of John. Um, 
so, uh, but uh, it says God has moved into the neighborhood as what, that's what Eugene Peterson says in the message. But um, the word in Greek is tabernacle. And this is significant because um, the tabernacle, the Holy of Holies is the place of worship for the Jewish community, right? The gospel of John um, is moving the place of worship from the holies of holies, from the four walls of the Jewish temple into human bodies. God has moved into the neighborhood and put the tabernacle in a human flesh. And so this is not something that we can um, relate to at all today where we um, can no longer worship in the building as we uh, used to um, or, you know, or are outcast um, from, from the way things have always been like uh, the Johannine community was where they no longer can worship in the Jewish temple because they now believe in the resurrected Christ and they have been cast out. Um, and, um, and their Jewish temple has recently been destroyed for a second time. And so the whole question of that the society that this text is written for is what do you do now that you can no longer depend upon the four walls of the temple for worship? And John's profound answer is, God has moved worship into human bodies. And so wherever human bodies are gathered, their worship can happen. Um, and, and that's part of what God entering into the world means. God loves the world in this way by taking on our thisness and our bodies and our flesh and making this holy, a place of worship. Imagine that. I am a place of worship and so are you. Uh, because of what God has done in, um, in the incarnation of Christ. And so the woman at the well asks Jesus this question. She says, where's the right place to worship? Is it, with, is it in um, the four walls of the temple in Jerusalem? Is it outside on the mountain or in the parking lot, like my people are currently worshiping on Saturday? Yeah. And Jesus says, neither place. It's neither place. But the hour is coming and is now here when people will worship in truth and in light. And that's the profound thing that is the result of this, th this text, John 3, 16. That's what brings on flesh. And she goes and shares that with a witness of this to her whole village and, and, and a whole village um, becomes Christian because of her testimony. And, and that's, what, um, that's what evangelism should look like, not holding up a sign that says, you better get Christ in you or else. <laughs> but it should look like invitation to experience those promises of God because they have changed me. She says, come and see a guy that told me everything that I've ever done because I have been changed by this word. It should be an invitation uh, to that abiding that we get in Christ. God has moved into our neighborhood and made our bodies holy. And so now come and see how your body is also holy. That's the, the, the witness um, at the core of the Gospel of John that you wouldn't get if you just read John 3.16 out of context. <laughs> so there you go. Now you got um, two chapters of John for the price of one. One verse. <laughs> Good question or comment. I, I'm sure I talked more. Uh, other <laughs> other questions. All right, you guys are a quiet group. My first group had me <clears throat> uh, answering questions for quite a while. So <laughs> um, let's see. That's most of what I have to say. Um, so I think that's pretty good. We got, we're 20 minutes short of an hour. Um, and I'll, I'll let you have, uh, have the rest of the time to, uh, to sit and think. And I recommend to you the Gospel of John. May you, may you have life through these words. Um, that's what the Gospel of John is written for. The, the, at the end of the Gospel of John, it says, these words were written so that you also will believe so that you also will have life. Uh, and so uh, if, if you're reading it and it's not giving you life, then it's not doing its job. 
Um, and, and, and that's the other most frustrating thing about John 3.16 is that most of the way that I have heard it um, in my life is not life-giving. And, um, and so I, I encourage you to keep reading, not just verse 17, because I think you should have that on your license plate as well, but uh, the whole Gospel of John is a beautiful witness to how God has moved into the world. Um, and it can teach us a lot today um, as we struggle the same way the Johannine community, well, not exactly the same way, but in many similar ways um, with, with the way we worship, the way we are in, in life in the world. Um, and so here are words of life. Uh, and let us close with uh, the Lord's Prayer as Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.